Founded with a steadfast commitment to delivering unparalleled education, the Academy of Emergency Sciences has consistently set the standard. Our distinguished faculty, comprised of specialist doctors, brings their extensive real-world experience to the forefront, ensuring that our students receive the highest caliber of education. From American Heart Association, AHA, Basic Life Support, BLS, to Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support, ACLS, and Pediatric Advanced Life Support, PALS, courses. Our mission is to empower our students to lead resuscitations with absolute confidence. Consistently top-rated courses, a testament to our unwavering commitment to providing an exceptional learning experience, proven by our countless satisfied students. Yet, our commitment extends beyond the fundamentals. Academy of Emergency Sciences goes the extra mile offering supplementary courses, including the complimentary advanced airway course, enriching our students' knowledge. Join us in our mission to create a safer world through knowledge, expertise, and an unwavering dedication to life-saving. Academy of Emergency Sciences. Resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. In a world where knowledge is power, the Academy of Emergency Sciences celebrates a decade of excellence. For 10 remarkable years, we have been a beacon of unmatched medical training, founded with a steadfast commitment to delivering unparalleled education. The Academy of Emergency Sciences has consistently set the standard. Our distinguished faculty, comprised of specialist doctors, brings their extensive real-world experience to the forefront ensuring that our students receive the highest caliber of education. From American Heart Association, AHA, Basic Life Support, BLS, to Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support, ACLS, and Pediatric Advanced Life Support, PALS, courses. Our mission is to empower our students to lead resuscitations with absolute confidence. Consistently top-rated courses, a testament to our unwavering commitment to providing an exceptional learning experience, proven by our countless satisfied students. Yet, our commitment extends beyond the fundamentals. Academy of Emergency Sciences goes the extra mile, offering supplementary courses, including the complimentary advanced airway course, enriching our students' knowledge, Join us in our mission to create a safer world through knowledge, expertise, and an unwavering dedication to life-saving. Academy of Emergency Sciences, 
Resuscitation is our calling. Education, our passion. In a world where knowledge is power, the Academy of Emergency Sciences celebrates a decade of excellence. For 10 remarkable years, we have been a beacon of unmatched medical training, founded with a steadfast commitment to delivering unparalleled education. The Academy of Emergency Sciences has consistently set the standard. Our distinguished faculty, comprised of specialist doctors, brings their extensive real-world experience to the forefront, ensuring that our students receive the highest caliber of education. From American Heart Association, AHA, Basic Life Support, BLS, to Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support, ACLS, and Pediatric Advanced Life Support, PALS, courses. Our mission is to empower our students to lead resuscitations with absolute confidence. Consistently top-rated courses, a testament to our unwavering commitment to providing an exceptional learning experience, proven by our countless satisfied students. Yet, our commitment extends beyond the fundamentals. Academy of Emergency Sciences goes the extra mile offering supplementary courses, including the complimentary advanced airway course, enriching our students' knowledge. Join us in our mission to create a safer world through knowledge, expertise, and an unwavering dedication to life-saving. Academy of Emergency Sciences. Resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. Good morning and welcome to the Resuscitation Essentials for Moonlighters, or REM webinar. We want everyone to have the best learning experience possible, so please observe the following guidelines during the lecture. First, please keep your microphones on mute. Second, you are invited to type in your questions in the chat box at any time or ask them live at the end of the lecture. Lastly, the attendance link will only be posted in the chat box at the end of the webinar. A pleasant morning once again and enjoy today's lecture. Good morning and welcome to Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, and young doctors. Greetings and welcome to our distinguished webinar series, REM, Resuscitation Essentials for Moonlighters, a tribute to the Decade of Excellence at the Academy of Emergency Sciences. As an accredited American Heart Association training partner for BLS, ACLS, and PALS, we have consistently upheld the belief that resuscitation is not merely a task, it is our unwavering calling. Our motto, Resuscitation is our calling, education our passion, underscores our enduring commitment to the art of life-saving. The choice of the acronym REM for this webinar is not by chance. It reflects a profound connection with scientific research, suggesting that REM sleep is when we most effectively consolidate learning and memory. Today, we gather to deepen your knowledge and enhance your resuscitation skills with the firm belief that the wisdom imparted here 
will translate into lives saved. This year-long webinar series is generously offered free of charge, our humble contribution to advancing the realm of resuscitation education. We are resolute in our mission to empower young doctors and healthcare professionals with the essential knowledge required for their arduous moonlighting shifts. We express our profound gratitude for your presence here today, and we invite you to embark on this journey of enlightenment with us. Together, let us strive for excellence and remember, resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. It is with great anticipation that we look forward to collectively advancing our understanding and proficiency in resuscitation. Good morning, everyone. We are very fortunate to have with us today our speaker. Uh, she's a graduate of Health Sciences from the Ateneo de Manila um, University. She took up her Doctor of Medicine and Master of Business Administration at the Ateneo de Manila School of Medicine and Public Health and went on to do her specialty training in emergency medicine, where she, she served as the chief resident at the Makati Medical Center. Currently, she's an active consultant of the Makati Medical Center and the BRP Medical Center, and also is an BLS and ACLS instructor under the American Heart Association for the Academy of Emergency Sciences. Friends, colleagues, it is with great privilege that I introduce our speaker today, Dr. Samantha Gail Kosalan. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. So good morning, everyone. Let me just share my screen. We hear you loud and clear, doc, and we see your slides. Okay. So good day. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Palad. My name is, again, Samantha Pasalan. So majority of you are young doctors who are probably moonlighting or thinking of moonlighting or are in residency training. So a lot of my colleagues actually that I've met during my career have also moonlighted and told me their stories of and their experiences of how it was. So personally for me, I did moonlight because I was too scared as a new graduate and I wasn't really confident in handling critical cases. So this webinar series is designed to aid in your current medical practice, especially when faced with arrested patients. So thank you again to the Academy of Emergency Sciences for inviting me, and thank you for providing this educational series to our young doctors. So the topic that I will discuss today is the five H's when it comes to your arrested patients, how to diagnose, and how to treat. These are your reversible causes of cardiac arrest. Later on during the series, you will also be talking about the five T's, which are also your reversible causes of cardiac arrest. <clears throat> so if you have been part or witnessed an if you've been part of a team or witnessed an arrest in the hospital or in the floors or in the ICU, you know that we work as a team. In fact, the one thing you do when you encounter an unconscious patient is that you call for help. So healthcare providers use a systematic approach to treat and ar to treat arrested and acutely ill or injured patients. So a high performance team guide, guide our actions by following a systematic approach such as this. So you assess the patient, you do your BLS, you do your primary assessment, and you do your secondary assessment. So we will be focusing on our secondary assessment, which involves the differential diagnosis, a focused medical history, searching and treating for your underlying causes, which are your H's and T's. So this is just a sample picture from the internet, but I'm sure all of you are familiar that during a scenario of arrest, it's crowded, everyone is running, everyone is rushing, everyone has specific jobs that we have to do. So it's very important for doctors, actually not even doctors, but also for nurses who work in the critical areas like the ER and the ICU, to be familiar with uh, how we manage an arrest. So um, personally speaking, 
a lot of our nurses, for example, in Mahati Medical Center are very uh, competent when it comes to arrest patients. So sila na mismo pwede mag-ACLS. So actually knowing your reversible causes of death can help improve your patient outcome. So let's focus on our secondary assessment. So how do you perform a secondary assessment, especially with all the chaos of an arrest? So during an arrest, you will be thinking of multiple things. You have your ongoing arrest. You have to know where your defibrillator is, your intubation kit, your cardiac monitor. You have to think of your health team. Who is the team captain? Who is intubating? Who inserts an IV? Who will be performing CPR? Who will be in charge of your medications? But during an arrest, you have to consider that you should be able to inspect the patient. So part of your secondary assessment is you inspect the arrested patient. You check if the patient has any open wounds, for example, a distended abdomen. Does he have a pacemaker on the chest? Does he have a scar from a previous cabbage? Is, are the clothes wet? Does he have an AV fistula? So these are clues that can actually help us determine our five H's. And we can do a brief history. So when we do a brief history on an arrested patient, who do we ask? So we ask the patient's companions who were with him during the incident. We can ask relatives who are also there. And of course, we can ask the ambulance personnel who brought the patient in. So just for example, we, what we usually ask is, did the patient complain of anything prior to the arrest? They can say, yes, doc, patient complained. Yes, doc, the patient was saying... He was experiencing chest pain and then became unresponsive. He was complain she was complaining of severe headache and then became unresponsive. So this gives us potential clues on what happened to the patient and if there are reversible causes. We can ask if the patient has any coexisting illnesses. We can ask a relative, is the patient hypertensive, diabetic? Does he have regular checkups with the doctor and the like? If the patient is a known patient in the hospital, maybe we can even retrieve an old chart of the patient. If the patient is a trauma patient, we can ask the ambulance personnel or the police who were at the scene, how did they discover the patient? Was he on the side? Was he on his back? Um, was, he, was there blood everywhere? Was he wearing a helmet? And other possible clues as well. So remember, a history and inspection of the patient can help us recognize your possible reversible causes of arrest. So what are your five H's and T's? So we refer to them with a mnemonic. So the H's and T's are a mnemonic. H's are your hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion or acidosis, your hypo or hyperkalemia, and your hypothermia. The T's are your tension pneumothorax, tamponade, toxins, pulmonary thrombosis, and coronary thrombosis. So this is just a memory aid for the potential, potential reversible causes of cardiac arrest and emergency cardiopulmonary conditions. So it's important to note that usually hypovolemia and hypoxia are the two most common underlying and potential, potentially reversible causes of your PEAs or your pulseless electrical activity. So let's focus on the H's. So it is important to remember that these are your best guesses only or your intelligent guesses. And during cardiac arrest, we can actually treat these right away. So as we go on this lecture, we will be giving uh, case scenarios on possible patients that arrive in the emergency department who have these H's and T's. So for the first case, you have an 80-year-old male who was brought to the emergency department unconscious. He has a one-week history of watery stools around 10 episodes a day with fever, nausea, and multiple episodes of vomiting. For our second case, we have our 40-year-old male, known alcoholic and liver cirrhosis. One night prior, he went binge drinking and had multiple episodes of vomiting of blood. So what do you think are is a possible H for this patient? So clearly the answer is your hypovolemia. So what is a common theme 
for these patients is that they have fluid loss. So for hypovolemia, you have the loss of your intravascular volume. So it's important to remember your physiology because it's the basis of your treatment. So when you have a loss of blood volume or intravascular volume, your body has a classic physiologic response of sinus tachycardia. However, your BP eventually drops depending on the amount of, of volume loss and you develop hypotension that eventually deteriorates to your pulseless electrical activities. You, actually, you can actually consider volume infusion for a PEA associated with a narrow complex tachycardia. So treatment is inserting two large bore IV lines, insert double lines, and you can start your volume infusion with normal saline or lactated ringers. So you can just simply, while ongoing CPR, you can say, start fast drip, keep, keep the IV line open, one liter. Avoid D5 containing water because it will actually reduce your serum sodium too rapidly. So your safest bet is your plain NSS, or your lactated ringers. So for the next case, we have a 55-year-old who was brought to the ED unresponsive as well. She has a five-day history of fever and cough with difficulty breathing. Another, you have an 80-year-old male who was brought to the emergency department unresponsive. He actually has a history of anemia due to multiple chronic illnesses, and, was, and he was admitted four months prior for blood transfusion. So what do you think is the age for this patient? So if you guessed hypoxemia, you are correct. So hypoxemia means you have a low level of circulating oxygen in the blood, which can lead to hypoxia at the tissues. So for the first case of a female with fever, cough, and difficulty breathing, this is actually very common during the time of, during the peak of COVID, the Delta variant. A lot of the patients were brought to the emergency department um, unresponsive with a history of fever, cough, and colds, and it was COVID. So their arrest was brought on by their hypoxemia. For the second case, you have a history of anemia. So your low blood cells co causes a low a decrease in oxygen carrying capacity leading to your hypoxemia. Other possible causes of hypoxemia, you can have your hanging injuries, your drowning, airway obstructions, severe asthma attack, patients with a CNS lesion causing your central hypoventilation can also present with hypoxemia. So again, you have your low levels of circulating oxygen causing your tissue hypoxia. The treatment is just oxygenation and ventilation. So the basic, you will discuss the basic methods of this. You open the airway, you provide your basic ventilation, know how to use your basic airway adjuncts and suctioning. So for ventilation, how do you open the airway? So this first picture actually shows obstruction of the airway by the tongue on this patient. So how do we treat this? I'm sure you're all familiar. So actually the second picture shows the head tilt chin lift maneuver that you can see lifts the tongue and relieves the obstruction. However, what maneuver do you use when you have a trauma patient with suspected cervical spine trauma? You do your jaw thrust maneuver. So you're able to keep the cervical spine stable and relieve the air and relieve the airway obstruction. So next, this is what is commonly used uh, before you intubate the patient. So you, we do your two rescuer bag valve mask ventilation. So this actually delivers 500, delivers your positive pressure ventilation around 500 to 600 ml of tidal volume sufficient to produce chest rise over one second. So you have two rescuers. The first rescuer is at the patient's head and holds the mask in a C and E position to create a tight seal and tilts the head. And then the second rescuer is in charge of slowly squeezing the bag. So both rescuers should observe for a chest rise. And please don't forget, sometimes um, because of the stress of a cardiac arrest, sometimes you forget that always give two breaths 
in to 30 chest compressions. Another way to relieve airway obstruction is using your oropharyngeal airway. This is a J-shaped device that fits over the tongue to hold it to hold the tongue and the hypopharyngeal structures away from the posterior wall of the pharynx. First, you need, of course, to suction the mouth to remove any secretions, blood, vomit, or food. So using the oropharyngeal airway, it's given, it's used on unconscious patients without a cough or gag reflex. So make sure they have no cough or gag reflex. So it can also help facilitate the suctioning of intubated patients. Um, I'm sure that's very common in the emergency department, especially if you work there, you'll note that it's there in the crash cart. But remember, size is important. So you have to properly measure your oropharyngeal airway. If it is too large, it can actually obstruct the larynx or cause trauma to the, to the laryngeal structures. And if it is too small, you can actually push the base of the tongue backwards and obstruct the airway more. So how do you measure the size? So that's seen in the top picture. So from the corner of the mouth, place it there, and then the tip should be at the mandible of the patient. And when you insert an oropharyngeal airway, you have to curve it upwards first. So you insert it um, upwards. So the curve should be upwards towards the hard palate and rotate it 100 degrees down. Next, of course, is your endotracheal intubation. So this is a critical skill that you should know, especially if you're going to moonlight in the ER or the ICU or maybe even the floors. So it's a little intimidating at first, but once you get the use of it, it becomes second nature to you. So there are steps to perform intubation. You prepare your materials, position the patient, you perform the intubation, you inflate the cuffs, attach the bag, confirm correct placement, and secure the tubes. So it is important to, rem to remember um, for moonlighters, wherever you work, or for nurses, for all medical um, personnel, make sure you are familiar with the materials where you work, especially if you work in different hospitals. So you have to know where is the crash cart, what medications are available in this hospital, what kind of defibrillator machine you will you be using, and make sure you are familiar with how to use the machine. You know how to turn it on, adjust the settings, um, adjust the charges, and the like. So this table is from uh, Tintinali, 9th edition. So these are just the basic equipment needed for airway management. You have your oxygen source, your tubing, masks, your airways, your catheters, your suction catheters, soft and hard like the young tower. You have a good suction source. Um, you have a pulse oximetry. You have various sizes of your ET tubes, syringes, stylets, etc. And of course, just in case you cannot intubate the patient for whatever reason, you have your rescue devices like your laryngeal mask airway and your surgical kit as well. So um, just basic information on, on a lot of misconceptions and how to intubate. So first, you need to position your patient. Make So for this, this is the optimal height of the patient. Make sure the patient's head is below your cycloid. Doc, we lost your audio, Doc. Ah. Okay, so okay. Um, so for positioning, make sure that the patient's head is below your cyphoid bone. And then to have effective visualization of the epiglottis and vocal cords, you actually have to align the external auditory canal of the patient to their cyphoid notch to improve the visualization of the glottis. So uh, you see a lot of um, doctors putting the rolled towel underneath the shoulders. So what happens is when you hyperextend the neck extremely, you actually block your view more. So you have to make sure that the head, the external auditory canal of the patient and the cyphoid notch align to have the best visualization of the glottis.
So these are just your basic steps. Of course, clear, clear the mouth. The patient has dentures, remove them, suction the airway clear of any blood, food, or vomit. Hold the laryngoscope in your left hand, of course. And also, especially remember to select the appropriate ET tube. So for males, it's usually 8 to 8.5 millimeters of the inner diameter. For females, 7 to 7.5 millimeters. So this is how you hold the tube. You hold it at the base with your thumb up. And then you use a scissor motion to open the mouth and facilitate laryngoscope passage. So if you notice that some doctors like to hold it too high, so if you hold it too high here on the handle, it's actually called the death grip because it's not an effective way to hold your ET tube. So blades. So we have there two kinds of blades for direct in for the direct intubation. You have your Macintosh, which is on the upper picture, or your curved blade, versus your Miller here in the lower picture, which is your straight blade. So one is not better than the other. So it really depends on your personal preference. So when you use the Macintosh blade, so here the Macintosh, this is the curved blade. You place it in the vallecula to indirectly lift your epiglottis to view the vocal cords versus a Miller blade where the tip of the blade physically lifts the epiglottis to, epiglottis to visualize your larynx. So the best method to confirm successful placement of your tube is to directly visualize the tube between the vocal cords. And again, to minimize oxygen desaturation, because we're talking about hypoxemia, limit each attempt to no more than 30 seconds. So it's a little intimidating because you have a time constraint here. Hindi pwede one minute ka, nakadalawang rhythm check na, you're still intubating. No. So you have to limit it to no more than 30 seconds. And the only way to do that is to practice and practice. So the laryngeal mask airway, so this is an advanced airway alternative to your ET intubation. So you just insert it through the mouth of the patient and there it is. And it also it's available in several sizes as well based on the patient's estimated body weight. Okay, so for our next cases, you have a 57 year old male, this is a CKD patient, advised by his nephrologist to start on dialysis but refused. And you have a 38 year old female, she's known to have hyperthyroidism, lost to follow up, uh, came unresponsive according to her friend. She's been complaining of bilateral leg weakness one week prior. Eventually, she's unable to ambulate. So what do you think are the causes of this? So that is your hypo or hyperkalemia. So what other causes do you think that can cause a hyperkalemia? So aside from CKD patients, patients with rhabdomyolysis can develop severe hyper, hyperkalemia. Drugs, um, different medications can cause hyperkalemia. And for hypokalemia, Patients on chronic steroids, laxatives, poor dietary intake, uh, losses, can all, like uh, diarrhea, can also cause your hypokalemia. So the important thing to remember about potassium is that it affects the heart. So whether you are hyper or hypokalemia, you are at risk of um, malignant cardiac arrhythmias. So when we say hyperkalemia, that's a serum potassium of more than 5.5 milli equivalent per liter. You have disordered membrane polarization, short showing your causing your short QT, prolonged PR, you have your peak T waves, QRS widening. Eventually, you go into your diastolic arrest, arrest and ventricular fibrillation. Treatment is your calcium chloride or calcium gluconate, sodium bicarbonate insulin, and glucose. So the resting membrane potential of your myocardium becomes less electronegative, and you have a slower and reduced amplitude of action potential. So if hyperkalemia is, is suspected, 
during the arrest cycle, you can actually administer these medications already. So just a detailed list of detailed um detailed list of the medications. So your calcium chloride and calcium gluconate is given through an IV. They actually their mechanism is membrane st stabilization. Your sodium bicarbonate can also be given. It's 50 to 150 mix IV. So it can actually shift your potassium intracellularly. Albuterol is usually given for patients who are awake. But you can also give your insulin and glucose, 5 to 10 units regular insulin IV, along with 25 grams of glucose. So it also shifts your potassium intracellularly. So for the hypokalemia, your serum potassium is less than 3.5. You have your prolonged QT, um, flattened T waves. You have your tachyarrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, tarsads, VTAC, and BFib. So hypokalemia actually makes your resting membrane potential more negative. So it enhances the depolarization of your T waves. So for the previous patient earlier, um, tyrotoxicosis can actually cause transcellular shifts of your potassium, leading to hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So if we have patients presenting with bilateral leg weakness, and then labs show that they're, they have very low potassium, we actually work them up for thyroid illness as well. So hypokalemic cardiac arrests are actually very rare. So, But the treatment is rapid administration of IV potassium. There's actually, you can give 10 mex per 100 ml KCL over 5 minutes, along, of course, with plain LR as well. So there are limited evidence on the, on the procedure for administering IV potassium appropriately and, safety, and safely. And these are really based on case reports. Okay, for the next case, we have a 19-year-old male, known type 1 di diabetic, who was admitted two months prior for DKA, however, with very poor, poor compliance to medications. And then you also have a 35-year-old female who was brought to the ER unresponsive. She's actually a known drug abuser. On inspection of the patients, you note that her lips are cyanotic and her pupils are pinpoint. Because usually if you're unresponsive, unresponsive or arrested, pupils are usually dilated. So this is your hydrogen ion or your acidosis. So the acidosis of cardiac arrest is actually a combination of your respiratory and metabolic acidosis. For the first case, the type 1 diabetic patient, most likely this is a DKA patient who usually, who usually presents with your high and ion gap metabolic acidosis. And for the 35-year-old female, you have to suspect a possible opioid overdose, which can cause your CNS and respiratory depression, accumulation of carbon dioxide, and your respiratory acidosis. Oh, sorry. So for respiratory acidosis, so there, this is very uh, physiolo physiology-based. So you have an increase in carbon dioxide. You have a compensatory increase in your respiratory rate. This can actually facilitate cardiac dysrhythmias. So remember, this, compensa this compensation is a limited response. Therefore, if it's persistent, we can facilitate your cardiac dysrhythmias. Treatment is intubation and ventilation. So once you intubate the patient, you can increase your ventilatory rate in order to blow off the excess carbon dioxide. For metabolic acidosis, you have a loss of bicarbonate and an increase in serum hydrogen, which can also increase your respiratory rate. And again, this can facilitate your cardiac dysrhythmias. So treatment is your sodium bicarbonate administration, 50 mex IV push. Uh, data, however, do not support routine administration of sodium bicarbonate. So if administered, you have to increase your ventilatory rate as well because when you give your sodium bicarbonate, it can actually increase your CO2 as well 
which can worsen the acidosis. So make sure that you increase the ventilatory rate as well. So for our next two cases, we have a 25-year-old male who drank with the friends the night before at the beach. So this is when you moonlight in the provinces. So he actually fell asleep outside. His lower body was submerged in the shore. Oh, sorry. And for example, we have a frozen pond, just an example. You have a 15-year-old female, unresponsive. She's an ice skater who fell through the pond. So what do you think is the age here? So of course, this is your hypothermia. So it's very rare in the Philippines because we live in a tropical country, but it is more common um, abroad where temperatures can be very low, especially at night. So hypothermia is when you have a body temperature of less than 30 degrees Celsius. So this is compounded if there's alcohol intake as well. So usually you have cases that fell in a frozen lake, went camping, and then fell asleep in his tent, developed hypothermia. And for our case, like at the beach, and he fell asleep outside, and his lower body was submerged. So for patients in cardiac arrest with hypothermia, of course, you follow the guidelines, CPR, medications, and provide your rewarming. So if you're exposed to extreme temperatures such as cold, initially you will have your <clears throat> peripheral vasoconstriction and an initial increase in your heart rate and blood pressure. However, you could, however it, if it progresses, you eventually develop your bradycardia, hypotension, and myocardial irritability. And at around 28 degrees Celsius, there is a risk for your malignant cardiac dysrhythmias. So hypothermic cardiac arrest patients are actually in a low flow state. In other words, it, it will be very difficult to check for a pulse. So make sure you check for a pulse central. And if you have other um, ways to check for a pulse, like ultrasound, auscultate, then that, then that could be helpful. Treatment, and very important because you're in a low flow state, is high quality CPR and prevention of further heat loss. If you're in, um, for the Philippines, you can do your core rewarming, re such as placing blankets and warm IV fluids. If you're in another country, like uh, the United States, they usually transfer them to an extracorporeal life support center or ECLS. So it's a cardiopulmonary bypass system to help rewarm the patients. And if it's not available, according to Tintinali, you can actually do thoracic lavage with normal saline at 38 to 42 Celsius using a chest tube. So there we have it. You have your five H's, your hypovolemia, hypoxia, hypo or hyperkalemia, hydrogen ion, and hypothermia. So remember, these are only best guesses to aid in reversing arrest to aid in reversing arrest and to provide, we need to provide treatment right away. Majority of the time, patients will have a combination of the H's and the T's so you can treat for both. For example, a CKD patient who has both anemia and hyperkalemia. So that's very common. Uh, heart failure patients with diuretics, also with diarrhea and vomiting. That's very common. Um, Patients with pneumonia that present with hypoxia as well as hypovolemia. So that's also very common. So when, again, it's important to stress that during an arrest cycle, it's important that we do not be overwhelmed. It can be overwhelming, but you can still do a focused history as well as inspecting the patient can help give you clues on these possible H's and T's. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sam, for that very comprehensive and thorough discussion of the reversible causes of cardiac arrest, especially the, the H's. I have some questions coming in over Facebook and YouTube. Are, are you okay to answer some of the questions from the audience? 
right. So um, um, we have a question here is, uh, Doc, um, okay lang ba magbigay ng routine bicarb and calcium during uh, DOA? So I'm thinking uh, yung routine bicarb and calcium during cardiac arrest. Um, so routinely, we do not give bicarbonate, especially if we have no indication to give a bicarbonate. So if you have an indication, which is your best guess, which is your H, which are your H's and T's, then you can give. So for example, like in our case, CKD patient who does not want to do dialysis or a CKD patient on dialysis who missed three sessions. We can assume that because he missed three sessions of dialysis, we can assume that he has hyperkalemia. So that's when we can give our bicarb. But for example, if you have a trauma patient um, who was in a motorcycle accident, then we do not just give routine bicarb. So we have to, there should be a basis based on your history on why we should give bicarbonate. Okay. Um, thank you, Doc. Another question is, this routinely comes out uh, how long do you run a code? <laughs> so, <laughs> every every webinar series yeah. like how long yeah. should you run a code? <laughs> okay. So this is based on personal experience. Okay. Um it really depends case by case. So if you have, for example, a 98-year-old female who arrives, then and the initial rhythm, for example, is asystole. You can just run it for a short while because the patient is 98 years old. Very poor prognosis already. So you don't have to go full effort for that. If, if you have a patient, for example, that when you talk to the ambulance team, for example, hi, sir, you ask the ambulance, what time did, the pa what time did you arrive at the scene? That's why it's very important to do a short history. The ambulance says, Doc, we arrived there at 10 a.m. And then we started CPR. And when you check the time, it's already 12 noon. So huh? it's been two hours already. So it's very, very poor prognosis already. So you don't need to um, run the code long. Versus, for example, you have a 45-year-old male complaining of chest pain. He was rushed to the ER. Then on transit to the ER, while at the car, he became unresponsive. So you have a downtime of like 10 to 15 minutes. Then when he was brought to the, um, to the critical area, the initial rhythm is ventricular fibrillation. So those are the cases that you have to spend a lot more time on. Um, recently, we just had an arrest code, which is very similar to what I said. And they spent two hours on it. And they revived. So it's really a case-to-case -case basis. You have to um, know the patient, know the history in order to determine how long you should spend time on a code. But there's no black and white rule that 30 minutes only. If none and 30 minutes, and stop na. So it really depends per case. Because you, if you as achieve ROSC in between those cases you, and then the patient codes again, you can actually spend a lot of time trying to revive that patient. So it really depends on the case. Thank you, Doc. Doc, we have a question from Dr. Espina. Um, do all sudden death patients uh, require a CT scan? I, I think cranial CT scan. I, I'm, I'm not sure. So, baka cranial CT scan, I'm not sure. So, uh, lahat ba ng sudden death patients uh, require a CT scan? If you revive them, ba? if not revive, if you ROSC. I think siguro as part of the post test workup. So it also actually really depends. Um uh, a lot again, a lot of these that's why nag residency ako because these are the things that I you really have to learn. But uh that's why hindi ko kaya mag moonlighting that. Eh. But for a lot of these patients for example, you have one pa not all. Not all. But if you have for example a patient who complained of headache before losing consciousness, then you can do a CT scan. So it really depends on the case. But it's not a standard practice. So it really depends on the case and what happened to the patient prior to his arrest. Thank you, Doc. So it, it should be history-based, no? not just like a blank uh, CT.
and for everyone post arrest. Hi, and ano rin po? Um, sorry, just to add lang din. Um, also, just to add like a small side note, one flu that we also use there is if we're able to revive the patient and we check the pupils, for example, if they're anisocoric, then that's one, well, that's another indication to provide a scan if the pupils are anisocoric. So maybe there's a bleed. Thank you, Doc. Um, Doc, we have a question from Nurse 95RR. Um, how much fluids for hypovolemia? Uh, 300, 500, 1 liter, uh, NSS or LR or D5? Yeah, that's um, the question. So you can, have, you can use NSS or LR. That's okay. Usually, kami, um, we do 1 liter open line. Or sometimes two lines, one is open, another is um, at 40 ml per hour. And then we avoid D5 containing fluids because it can really, it we avoid D5 containing fluids. So it's better that you stick to your NSS and LR during an arrest if you're hydrating the patient. Great. Um... No, we still have time for a few more questions. I got a lot of questions coming. All right, so we're going to take three more questions if you don't mind. Is that okay? Hi, Pop. All right. Um, is it okay to hyperventilate patients na asthma or COPD? So I think asking if, uh, if hypoxic arrest, can we hyperventilate the, the patient? What are your thoughts on that? So if you achieve... ROSC, so important to note that um, your physiology is different. So COPD, you have your usual CO2 retention. So if you're thinking of respiratory acidosis for them because they're COPD patients, you can increase your ventilatory rate to blow off the excess carbon dioxide and decrease your acidosis. If you're able to do an ROSC for the patient, if you're able to revive the patient as well, of course, you can do a blood gas for it to be easier. And then you can see exactly the parameters of what you're dealing with. But usually, we, uh, if we hook the patient to a mechanical ventilator, we start the respiratory rate at around 16 to 20, the average respiratory rate, and then adjust it accordingly based on the blood gas. How about uh, intra-arrest? Doxam, is it okay to have her ventilate your patients like uh, yeah, while you're yeah. running the code? Because uh, 30 is to 2 lang, di ba? Well, if arrest or, yeah. well, if you have an advanced airway na po, um, you can do one breath every 6 seconds. So that's what you can do. Uh, I have an interesting question here. Um, uh, kapangalan mo, Doxam. Doxam is asking, pwede na ba yung lab? for hypothermia lamp so i guess yung ano yung yung warm yung lamp ah, yung, <laughs> yung lamp <laughs> yung yellow lamp pink <laughs> yung pag nagpo procedure that's a good question <laughs> pwede na ba daw yan actually that's a good question um usually if well of course hindi pwedeng lamp lang but um ito doc pao if you have an opinion din but usually if you have a hypothermic patient Especially, if, for example, wet yung clothes. Of course, you remove the clothes. Um, you can give your warm fluids. Uh, you can put blanket. Yung lamp, mahirap kasi kung ongoing arrest, baka walang space. Pero, if, I, don't, I don't see what's the harm. Marang ganyan. Yung lamp. But that's a good question. Every person that I've, I've never treated a hypothermic cardiac arrest. So, <laughs> so my, my concern would also be logistics. No? <laughs> Kung hindi ba siya sa gaban. <laughs> Oo, oh, yun lang yung concern ko. Saan siya yung pag po sa arrest? But that's a, actually a good question. Napaisip ako doon. Ah. Yeah. And then, Prioritize uh, na lang muna like blankets and warm saline. Uh, okay, this is the last question. No, sorry, um... Uh, we can't answer everything, uh, but we really appreciate everyone's active participation for uh, uh, posting all these questions. No? So our last question, Doc Sam, before I let you go, um, is an EMT though in the Middle East and then 
they give uh, naloxone daw for mga cardiac arrest patients no? for hypoxic arrest. Uh, is it the same protocol daw in the, the Philippines? And do you recommend giving naloxone for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? Well, in the Philippines, the EMT setup is very different compared to the EMTs abroad. Um, when we would, you, most of the time, the ambulances here have a doctor with them. So I have yet to see an EMT in the Philippines who have given naloxone mismo. Usually what happens is they bring the patient to the emergency room and that's where they administer the naloxone. But yes, for patients that were suspecting possible opioids, um, we do give naloxone at the emergency room. But I don't think that they give it in the emergency ambulance. But it's a very different practice, yung practice ng EMTs abroad and in the Philippines. But if you have a doctor on board in the ambulance, the ambulance, depending on the ambulance service, some of them have naloxone, which you can give to the patient. Doc, you don't If you don't mind, okay. Lang. One more before I let you go. How much bicarb to, to give? 50 max, okay na. I guess one amp, I think, is 50 max. So, okay na. <laughs> you can give 50 max, IV push. 50 to 150 for um hyperkalemia, actually. But you can give at least 50. That's good. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thank you again, Doc Sam. I know yeah, you're very so busy. <laughs> Pardon, sorry. In All right. So, uh, thank you, Doc Sam. No, I know you're very busy. Thank you so much for imparting your wisdom and experience with us. I really appreciate it. And to all the attendees who've joined us via YouTube, Facebook Live, and Zoom, I really appreciate you spending your time with us. And uh, the attendance link is on the chat box. It will be only active for 15 minutes. So please uh, make sure to sign in your attendance so that you receive your certificate. So thank you again. And we hope to see you in the next month's webinar. Thank you, Doc Sam. Thank you, thank you doctors.